On this field is the next Roger Clemens and the next Frank Thomas. Or maybe they're on a field like this one somewhere. But what if this time he doesn't get a shot to play beyond Little League because he doesn't have the money? What if the next Will Clark gives up baseball because in another sport, there's just more opportunity. The sport of baseball, I think, is something all Americans understand. And you combine that with the affinity for a university or a school, it's a perfect blend. My dad was this SID at Southern Miss, and the athletic director paid, paid me a silver dollar every game to chase down foul balls. Uh, and that was, I was four or five years old, so, and I followed it closely ever since. My pitching coach was an assistant coach for Ron Polk, and got into, in that family, basically, and everybody, once we got to know each other, everybody took care of me. And when Coach Pope left Georgia, come back to Mississippi State, a, a door opened for me at Georgia. When I was growing up in high school, um, was when Mississippi State had that, that really special team in 1984-85, Will Clark, Rafael Palmero, Bobby Thigpen, Jeff Brantley. That team captured the imagination of a lot of people. It's my favorite sport, college baseball. The sport of college baseball is growing, has been growing for a while, in terms of fan support, viewership, and in some places, revenue. The sport has grown more than any other men's sport since I have been riding sports in Mississippi, which is, I don't even like to think about how long it is, it's 55 years. The talent just continues to be better and younger. You take Major League Baseball, we're probably running 10 years, 10 consecutive years with an average Major League Fastball going up a half a mile per hour a year. It's incredible. Back in, in the late 80s, 80s and 90s, if, if you had a guy on your team who threw 90 miles an hour, that was really special. You know, 85 used to be a firm thrower when I was growing up, and then 90 was the benchmark, and now it's 95. And now every one of these SEC teams, all 14 of them, has got multiple guys that can, can throw that 95 miles per hour, so I just, the skill levels went up, the ball's coming off the bat harder than ever. The overall level of, of play has increased. For physical evidence as to the growing popularity of baseball at some Division I programs, just take a look at the facilities. It wasn't that long ago that Ole Miss was playing in a baseball park with, with wooden bleachers and not a, if you, if you had to go to the bathroom during the game, you had to walk down to a classroom two blocks away. But now, and, th and this is just, we're just talking about 40 years later. Now, you know, they've got luxury suites. They're packing 12,000 people into the ballpark. This level of baseball has always been viewed as a path to the majors. You have seen in the last three or four decades, Major League Baseball drafting more and more college players and focusing more because they realize that those guys are more prepared uh, to make the jump to the big leagues sooner. The percentage of high school players taken in the first 10 rounds of the Major League Draft has consistently gone down year after year, decade after decade. In 2019, just 19% of players drafted in the first 10 rounds were high schoolers, 
the lowest percentage ever. I'm so happy that I was not drafted out of high school. First of all, coming out of high school, I was, <laughs> I tell people, I grew probably two inches in college. You know, from my freshman year of college, from the time that I signed and left high school, I probably grew two inches, you know, and I was not big enough to go play professional baseball. I was not prepared mentally to be able to do that. I, you know, in my dream, I wanted to play in the SEC. I was not able to do that. I actually got a scholarship at the University of South Alabama, which to me, it turned out to be the perfect place for me you know I feel like getting that grooming in high school here in Prattville and then going to South Alabama South Alabama to me was a blue-collar school that was going to be the per preparation for me to be able to get ready for my lifelong dream which was playing in the big leagues. As more high school kids come out see that as a viable path more and more of them are choosing college over uh, going straight to professional baseball. But there is a problem a large gap separates two groups within college baseball. On one side are those who are benefiting the most from the sport's growth. And on the other side of the chasm are those who are benefiting the least. These kids that are playing college baseball, they're paying for the privilege to do that. Um, and let's be real clear, a football player is not paying for the privilege to go to a four-year institution. A basketball player is not paying. While players and families pay to play because of lack of available athletic scholarships. The draft numbers show the college game is as important to Major League Baseball as it's ever been. Meanwhile, more people are watching the sport than ever before, both in person and on television. The final game of the 2019 NCAA College World Series drew over two million viewers. They watched the Vanderbilt Commodores beat Michigan to capture their second NCAA title in six years. Pro teams see the benefit of the college game, as do conferences like the SEC and ACC and their television partners. The NCAA also rings the register. Baseball is the second leading producer of revenue for the NCAA behind men's basketball. They say, well, football's got to be one. <clears throat> well, they don't get a dime from football. The NCAA it goes to the bowls, the conferences, the participating schools. And so men's basketball is way ahead of us because of the venues and the, and the TV contract. And we're number two, women's basketball's three. I can go down the list, but we're number two. According to the NCAA's website, of the 90 championships it sanctions, only five sports generate at least as much money as they cost to run. Those five money makers include baseball. Every one of these baseball players, even at the very highest level, they're paying for the privilege. In, in some cases, if they're from out of state, Matt, some of these kids are paying very large sums of money. I, I think it's important for, for them to know that. And, and because they're willing to do that, I, I'm just gonna be perfectly candid. I think they're getting taken advantage of a little bit. In 2008, the NCAA reached a new agreement with the College World Series, an extension for the event to remain in Omaha, Nebraska for the next 25 years. The deal included the construction of a new $127 million ballpark. Experts estimate the economic impact of the College World Series for the Omaha area to be almost $50 million per year. People would be amazed. A lot of the guys that there are stars out there, a lot of guys that are gonna be high draft picks, don't even have athletic aid. All the other amenities for players, like the, uh, you know, the training facilities and everything else, they, they, they've been upgraded. The only thing that hadn't been upgraded is what the players realize from all the work they put into it. And they're not, they're not treated fairly, and there's no question. You know, are they getting taken advantage of? And, and I think they are. And, uh, and it's a shame, you know, it, it really is. Fair to say that the issue of 11.7 scholarships, has that ever come up in conversation? <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, why? Um, why? Why? Do we have this number? Each NCAA sport at the Division I level 
falls in one of two categories regarding athletic scholarships or athletic aid. Two different types of scholarship, right? So there's yeah. what we call headcount sports, in which if you're on any scholarship, you have to be on a full. Headcount means every athletic scholarship given in that sport is a full scholarship, covering the athlete's full cost of attendance. And then you have what's called equivalency scholarships. Baseball is one of those sports. Softball is one of those sports um, in which the scholarships can be broken into pieces. They almost have to with the, the limited supply. If a sport is in the equivalency category, it has a predetermined number of scholarships which are spread out across the entire roster of players. Full scholarship sports at the Division I level are football, men's and women's basketball, women's tennis, women's gymnastics, and women's volleyball. All others, including baseball, are equivalency sports. So I've been clear saying we should be looking at moving past the old days of equivalency scholarships. The equivalency model came about as part of a balancing act to maintain revenue streams in football and basketball, while at the same time satisfying federal Title IX requirements. Title IX, a civil rights law passed in 1972, prohibits colleges and universities from discriminating based on sex. Title IX is a wonderful thing. It's given so many opportunities to, to women to compete in athletics that 40 years ago, it just was not the same. And now you see the experiences that our, our female student athletes have here are just as, as strong as what our, our male student athletes have here. The, the growth of, of women's sports on our campuses is pretty remarkable. And, and you look at, um, you know, there's SEC schools that pack their, their gymnasiums on Friday nights for gymnastics. And, and you see big crowds at softball games across the SEC and, 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 and other leagues. Um, and, and you see the opportunity that, that those women have now that, that generations ago they didn't have. It's done so much good. In response to Title IX, scholarship money had to be budgeted proportionately. If 40% were budgeted for men, 40% must be also earmarked for women's athletics. At the time Title IX was enacted in 1972, just 30,000 women competed in college athletics. Today, that total is over 200,000. We have a federal mandate to, to comply with what Title IX is. And so you have football that has 85 scholarships, okay? and there's not necessarily an equivalent from a scholarship standpoint. And so that means you have to start offering more female sports than you do male sports because the scholarship requirements. That's nothing that the NCAA created. That's nothing that athletic directors created or baseball coaches created. There's no question that there are, there are schools that have in an effort to, to fund those opportunities uh, have had to cut back on, on the men's side to a certain degree. Um, obviously, men's programs at most of those places are still getting a lot of, a lot of support, um, but you don't see, a, a great way to illustrate it is it's not uncommon in the last 20 years to see a, a high major athletic program at a women's sport to satisfy Title IX requirements. Um, you would have to do a lot of digging probably to find the last time one of those universities have added a men's sport. We have to look at the entire department and say, okay, how are we gonna divide up our numbers so, to make sure that we're following federal law? 85 scholarships for the football team, plus Title IX requirements, along with the current equivalency model, equals the reason Division I baseball programs only have 11.7 scholarships for their entire 35-man roster. But baseball used to have more. You know, you start with why is it 11.7? Well, it used to be 13. And in the early 90s, an NCAA special committee had a 10% reduction in scholarships. Over the course of all men's sports, so it was football, basketball, baseball, all men's sports. So when I played at Mississippi State, my last year was 1990, and we had 13 scholarships. The sport of baseball had 13 scholarships. Initially allowed to give out 13 scholarships across its roster, that 1990 NCAA decision of a 10% reduction across all men's sports took baseball down to the uneven total of 11.7. Was that really um, a well-made decision? I, I'd suggest no. It, it wasn't great. Football went from 95 to 85, and I'm sure they thought that was a huge amount, but we've seen in football it really didn't affect the style of play. Baseball, that was a huge reduction, you know, when you're talking about um, 1.3 scholarships.
Division I baseball players getting partial scholarships, sometimes as little as 25%, means the majority are coming out of pocket to fund their own education and college career. They're paying to play. There's definitely a portion of our roster that we actively recruit, pursue to try to acquire skill. But then there's also seven, eight, nine, ten slots at the back end of our roster of who, who can pay their own way to come. It's a real challenge and unfortunately at the end of the day you're forced to put a price tag on every kid on your roster and, and every kid that you recruit and that's just an awful way to, that's not why we got into coaching. And the hardest part of my job and it just got harder this year is roster management and trying to figure out um, how to get our guys, you know, get keep everybody happy, do the right thing keep everybody inside the 27 and the 35 and all these extra rules. You got to bow for 25% in baseball, just everything they put on us. The financial piece is the last thing that you want to talk about. You know, you would like to just find the right kid and the right family, uh, express to them how you can help them grow as a person and obtain their degree and reach their potential as a baseball player. Oh, and by the way, I need you to pay this certain amount of money. Uh, it's not why we all got into this, but it's absolutely one of the, the biggest parts of being a college baseball coach, unfortunately. We're in higher education. I'm uncomfortable that we have baseball coaches in living rooms of prospects negotiating percentage points of a scholarship to access higher education. You know, the really, the NCAA's put it on the parents, and it's unfortunate, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, the average scholarship in college baseball is somewhere between 25 and 35 percent. And so if you've got a kid that's out of state in your university, you know, out of state tuition, a full scholarship would be 45000 That's a lot of money that parents are paying for their kids to get an opportunity to play college baseball. We've been so blessed here in the last eight, nine, ten years, the, the amount of first rounders we've had, a lot of first round picks, a lot of high level, high round picks. You know what our high, high, high picks do? The first thing they do when they get their signing bonus, they have to go pay their student loans. I mean, I want that to just set in for a second here. We have first round picks in this baseball program who are paying off their student loans is the first thing that they do to relieve the pressure off their parents. It's unlike any other sport, even the other equivalency sports, uh, that the amount of money that the participants, the players, uh, have to pay to play you know, their, their sport. And so, uh, you know, thankfully, the baseball parents seem to always answer. Here in Alabama, it's about $45,000 out of state. So uh, for everything included, and you start doing the math and you, you can have 27 players on scholarship, you have 11.7 .7 scholarships. So the median scholarship, theoretically, mathematically, is 43%. So we're asking out of state kids if they get the median scholarship to pay $25,000. And you know, you show this kid how much you want them with phone calls and texts and handwritten notes and you go watch them play and we love you, we love you, we love you, but we need you to pay $100,000 over four years to come play here. Uh, it, it can be a really awkward conversation. Now we've moved our draft into the middle of July even though all our scholarships have to be signed July 1st, and the transfer portal is closing now on July 1st. So we have all these factors to be able to put this together, and um, that's not even the main reason. The main reason is the kids deserve it. Our kids work just as hard or harder than any athlete on campus. Why do ours not get the opportunity to um, have the same amount of scholarship as the others? I mean, in a time where we're talking about paying students and everything else, these kids should be taken care of. And most of my kids, the average is 38%. They compare us to softball a lot, which there's a lot of similarities, uh, but it's, I think it's unfair to take it to where we just mirror one another. Yes, we both play on a diamond. Yes, we both throw a ball and use gloves and bats, um, but the way their game's played, they have less student athletes than us. You know, uh, they have more scholarships than us, but they have less student athletes than us. Uh, you know, a pitcher can you know pitch you know all seven innings. Um, a, a pitcher can pitch back to back days. You know, we we usually have somewhere between you know fifteen and twenty pitchers um, you know on a roster. That's how many players they have. But I think that's part of you know part of the issue sometimes with baseball is it's so coupled with softball. And it, it's, it's not softball, it's, it, it's a different game, even though there's a lot of similarities in the way we play the game. We have less scholarships in baseball now based on roster sizes, men and women. 
by far, not any close, dead last, way behind anybody else. For a sport that's the second largest producer of revenue for the NCAA championships, uh, that's not right. But baseball doesn't live in a vacuum in the college environment. You know, if, if all I had to do was run baseball, uh, you know, life would be fascinating. But we have 20 other championship sports, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. Our universities have to meet Title IX uh, requirements. Um, and if it was just its own sport, would we change? I think absolutely. So if you give baseball 18 additional scholarships uh, because of Title IX, which has done so much good, in, in our society, in our universities, uh, but you're gonna have to find 18 additional scholarships on the female side, on the women's side. So between softball and soccer and volleyball and track, you're gonna have to find 18 full scholarships, which um, my guess is most schools that really invest in the sport of college baseball, which are most of the ones, the SEC, the Big 12, the ACC, and several others, all Pac-12, wherever else, uh, would be more than happy to fund those additional scholarships for baseball and for those female sports. The, the challenge is you have 300-something um, Division I athletic programs in the NCAA, and a vast majority of them, for vast majority of them, funding those additional 36 or however many scholarships would be financially uh, a problem. Today, we are finally having an opportunity where we're going to start, where we're going to start getting ready to start playing tackle football. Um, we've had a group of kids that, you know, really we've been on the verge where we didn't really know if we wanted our kids to really get into the tackle yet, but they've grown, they've developed, so now we think it's that time. So today we want to be able to provide an uh, area where these kids can come play tackle football competitively and not have to break the bank to be able to do it. You know, a lot of times you get in these travel agencies and they, they cost you tons and tons of money. Five, six hundred dollars, maybe some a semester. Some even have up to twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars a semester. We look at, we don't want to do that because it can be done for cheaper. We charge keep parents a hundred dollars. You come out, you play a full season of football, you travel with us, you have a great time. Some of the things that you can't do, we'll have a fundraiser for just to be able to provide. We don't want nobody to be left out. His baseball stuff has been hung up in my garage for over a year and a half. And you're talking about a kid that was playing on a, a major team, can play a shortstop, center field, any position, do it well, and to not want to do it at all. Can't get him to go back. We've had teams call, say, uh, was Miles interested in playing? I was like, well, I'll ask him. And he's just like, I don't want to play. But we see it a lot when we go to the baseball field. And he'll say it. I don't see very many people look like us, Daddy. He fell in love with it for a little while, you know, and he's very athletic. And then it got to the point where he was just getting slow for it, you know, and he was traveling every weekend and, you know, and he's standing out in left field or he's standing in there and it got to be a point where he just kind of looking around. By the time I was nine years old, the only thing I ever said I wanted to do was be a Major League Baseball player. It wasn't like a maybe, it wasn't a dream, it was something that I knew I was gonna do. And it's hard to explain that to people. I wasn't heavily recruited. Coach Lambert knew the coaches at South Alabama and they had to come through here to go see some guy in Birmingham and they worked out for them to literally stop through and watch me work out. The minority and black kids are playing baseball. That's the lie that everybody likes to tell because it makes it easier to tell why this we have this problem, they're not playing. It's not the truth. What's happening is they're not able to play sometime 
say, in the travel ball ranks. That's where I'm worried about baseball in the black community is not because they can't play, they don't still play or whatever, but it's the fact that the opportunity to play Division I baseball, which is the separator for people. Oh, he's a very good baseball player, but I know that one time he gets to be a junior or senior, he either goes to JUCO, but if he wants to go to Division I, Division I area, I'm gonna have to come out of my pocket to be able to pay for him to go to college. Whereas he can go to the SEC and be an athlete, play football, basketball, even tra almost track and field. They may even give more scholarships than baseball does. The other big challenge for me now that we recruit so young, but by the time somebody's 14 or 15, if they if they're sitting here saying they're a really good athlete, then that means they've probably got opportunities in other sports. And if they choose a football or basketball, somebody has tapped them on the shoulder about 13 and has told them, man, you need to quit playing baseball. Because these other two sports that you're really, really good at, there's full scholarship opportunities there for you. I'm not even seen and looked at or whatever at a smaller school because it's like, oh, he's at a smaller school, he's doing this, well, that don't matter. A lot of people can be successful there. But the fact that I was in Division One and I was competing against SEC schools, you know, and playing Alabama and Auburn always motivated me. Playing Mississippi State always motivated me to have an opportunity to shine against those SEC caliber teams, knowing that the scouts were in the stand watching. These black athletes are, man, they're great players and moving on to the next level. And, and um, yeah, we need to do more. The reality is in, in travel basketball, a lot of diversity present. And so you're asking me about club baseball and its impact. Absolutely, it'll have an impact on participation opportunities. And, and how do those involved in that activity look differently at attracting people in, a broad spectrum of people. Really important issue. If we could say this is, you have the same opportunities in this sport as you do others, I think it would make a difference. We're losing athletes uh, to those sports because, uh, you know, it's become the, uh, the country club sport. It's become the sport that you, you got to have money to play. Uh, and not just the equipment, uh, but probably just the cost of making it happen. How does somebody get an hour and a half from their house and be able to stay there all weekend to play baseball at nine years old? So basically you're taking a whole group of people, <laughs> a whole group of athletes, and you're pretty much getting then move them out of the way where they're not able to play because one thing they're gonna need, they want and able, they need to have that scholarship available for them to get that free education. College baseball shouldn't be for those who can afford it. It ought to be for all those kids who wanna play it and that's what's disappointing to me. It's the rules and regulations of the NCAA that they have to understand that they are making it harder for things to be more diverse. They're making it harder for the uh, kids to be able to come into college. But it has taken an entire segment of population out of, out of play from a recruiting standpoint. Out of 299 Division I baseball teams, 64 will make the postseason tournament. Some of those will be schools that can't even fund all 11.7 baseball scholarships. They'll compete for the same title, the same trophy, against a school like Vanderbilt, which is able to award 11.7 and then some. I can tell you that college baseball is not a level playing field. The strongest variable in looking at a team's winning percentage over an eight or ten year period is going to be the dollars that they have access to. It's not necessarily coaching uh, or recruiting acumen or player development. In those conversations with coaches, there's going to be plenty of disagreement, but there are varying approaches to financial aid. So there's the 11.7, but that's not all the money that's going to be associated with financial support to, to a baseball roster. Some schools, because of in-state lottery scholarships, as well as need-based aid, are able to stack dollars on top of the 11.7. Other schools can't. Even in the top baseball league in America, the Southeastern Conference, the difference between one school to the next is drastic. Almost every school has a different scholarship scenario. And in college baseball right now, the schools who have the most scholarship aid are the ones who, who are really not, not just winning, they're, they're dominating. State-run lotteries often can have portions of profits go towards funding education for college students. 
That money can offset some of the cost of attendance for in-state students in states where those programs exist. For instance, in Louisiana, the Taylor Opportunity Program, or TOPS Scholarship, can help Louisiana students afford the cost of attending LSU if they meet certain academic requirements in terms of GPA, core classes, and ACT or SAT scores. The maximum TOPS payment for an LSU student is just under $4,000 a semester. Other states have similar programs. The HOPE Scholarship in Georgia, the Bright Futures program in Florida, as well as lotteries in Kentucky, South Carolina, and Tennessee. In Arkansas, not only does in-state money help students in the form of the Academic Challenge Scholarship, but additional legislation helps Arkansas recruit out-of-state students to become Razorbacks. The NRTA, Non-Resident Tuition Award, can waive the out-of-state fees for any student from a state that borders Arkansas, essentially treating those students as in-state. For example, if a student from Texas carries a 3.6 GPA, Arkansas's NRTA will cover 90% of the out-of-state cost. State-run lotteries give baseball coaches in those states more dollars to work with in recruiting, convincing players to sign with the motivation that families won't have to come out of pocket quite as much. When I was the head coach of Georgia, we had what they call the Hope Scholarship. If I recruit a boy in the state of Georgia, he gets free tuition and books if he had a 3.0 in high school. So I stayed in state because basically that take my 11.7 up to about 18 and 19. I thought I was stealing because I had the hope. Which is great. It's great. And those things were built for the regular student, not the student athlete. And so all those little bits start to give a school that only has 11.7. When you look at need-based scholarships, when you start looking at the state-based scholarships, you start looking at some of the academic scholarships, now that 11.7 may grow to 18, 19, 20 scholarships. It probably gives you, I would think, a little more advantage in recruiting that you have more money at your disposal. Mississippi and Alabama are currently the only two states in the SEC that don't provide state-run lottery money for recruiting in-state students. Here in Alabama, it's 11.7. We don't we don't have um, any state lottery dollars that are going that can provide a, a, a level of, of scholarship that some others that some other schools are getting. You know, I've had experiences during my time here where a kid from Birmingham who's a really good student can go to a, a bordering state SEC school for cheaper than they can stay in state and play at Alabama. I've had, you know, kids from Alabama from certain ethnicities or socioeconomic backgrounds that can go out of state to a private school for dramatically cheaper than they can come play here at Alabama. Vanderbilt University, the SEC's only private school has an advantage the other schools don't have in recruiting baseball players. It's called Opportunity Vanderbilt, a need-based scholarship program funded by the university's endowment. There are two ways to qualify for Vanderbilt, academically or athletically. In both, Vanderbilt takes the approach that no qualifying student should be eliminated from attending because of a lack of funds. Cost of attendance to Vanderbilt is over $67,000 per year. The need-based scholarship program qualifies families based on their yearly income, which then determines what amount they can afford to pay, and Opportunity Vanderbilt supplements the rest. For example, a recent university brochure explained a qualifying student from a family earning between eighty dollars and $100,000 annually could be awarded up to over $63,000 towards attendance, with the median award at this income level being just over $53,000 a year. Under new NCAA guidelines, an incoming Vanderbilt baseball player could have the large majority of his cost of attendance paid for by stacking this need-based aid on top of a small percentage of athletic scholarship. It was a decision not by the athletic department, by the university to say, hey, we're not gonna push away a kid, a student that can come here, can qualify to get in, you know, may find the next cure to cancer, but we're not gonna not allow him to come to school because he can't afford it.
you have to go back, you know, two years to the last College World Series. So Vanderbilt won the national championship, but Mississippi State and, and Auburn were there as well from our league. Well, those are two states that don't have these state-based lottery scholarship, and somehow they're competing in the top eight nationally. Then you have a private university that has a different reality upon it. Uh, and, you know, I think that was the year that Ole Miss played in our our conference championship game against Vanderbilt, as I recall. So the the issue of competitive parity actually is present even with 11.7. When I was at Arizona in 2016, we lost on the last play of the game in Omaha to Coastal Carolina. You know, what, what is, you know, obviously I was extremely disappointed for our team, but what a special moment that will live in the history of that university forever and ever. Can you imagine in the Southeastern Conference or Big 12 or PAC, can you imagine one football team having more scholarship aid than another? I mean, it, it would be on the front page of every newspaper in the country. It would be all over the internet. It would be the talk of all of sports. You know, I'll just use an example. If Alabama had one more scholarship than Auburn, Coach Kiffin brings in a recruit, you know, when you can do that again, when we get out of the pandemic and he has a visit. They, they're going to tour basically and do the same things that we're going to do. You know, they're going to show them campus, they're going to show them the academic center, they're going to show them the square and, and, and Oxford. And then he's going to sit down with that recruit and he's going to offer him a scholarship. That scholarship is the same scholarship that he gets at LSU, that he gets at Mississippi State, that he gets at Alabama and so on. And that kid's just happy to get an offer from Ole Miss. Well, we're going to do the same thing with our student athlete, our baseball player, our, our recruit. But the whole deal, the whole thing comes down to when I sit down with that family and offer them the scholarship, and it isn't the same scholarship as they get in Baton Rouge or they get in Starkville or they get in Tuscaloosa. And the way people you know, uh, explain the scholarship is different. And, and now uh, it's kind of like buying a car. I'm uncomfortable that we have baseball coaches in living rooms of prospects negotiating percentage points of a scholarship to access higher education. I actually start from that perspective and say, we should be having direct conversations about here's the scholarship support you're provided and let them decide. Not negotiate, well, I've got 26% of a scholarship and I've got 28%, and then trying to, trying to figure that out. College baseball is uneven, both as a sport compared to others, and within the sport, from one team to the next. To usher in change and to level the playing field, people outside of the sport will first have to be educated on the issues and then they'll have to care. I don't think we, you can ever say never. Our, our industry has continued to evolve dramatically. Um, there's been constant steps from full cost of attendance, unlimited meals. You're seeing all the name, image, and likeness legislation that's happening at the state level and probably at some point the federal level. So I, it, it would be naive for anybody to say never. Again, it's an issue that you know I've watched over the last you know 30 years as an assistant coach and a head coach. I'm not sure if it'll ever change you know uh, before I retire uh, or if ever. When we go to vote for anything, money, scholarships, whatever, you got 299 or whatever voting, and uh, you got 85 power five schools. I think it's 85, and we lose the vote every time. If it has something to do with being invested into it, because a lot of the other sports can't invest. I can't imagine trying to make rules for the University of Alabama that apply to a low Division one school in the Northeast. You know, it's just it's apples and oranges, and they're just entirely different situations. That's what Brad is saying: is uh, I don't want us legislating just the lowest common denominator. But we are connected in a system that has more than just one set of interests at play, and that's a piece of the challenge. That we're going to have to bring the Title IX component with us as we continue to try to figure this out. This has got to be packaged. It's got to be fixed. Don't want to take away anybody's scholarship pay. The more scholarship pay you have, I think that's great. But give everybody the chance to add scholarships, not just schools who have opportunities academically or through need-based or whatever it is. How do we adapt to a changing environment, I think is a really important question in college sports, whether it's transfer issues, name, image, and likeness issues, 
expectations that are changing of, of how we support our programs, but also the nature of scholarship. So I've been clear saying we should be looking at moving past the old days of equivalency scholarships. I think this conversation starts there. We, we just don't stand up and fight. And we're fighting not only for the national pastime, okay? You're fighting for the kids to get more money. You're fighting for the parents who have to fork out the money. You're fighting for coaches. Someone has to stand up and fight. <laughs>